Coming up on Fast TV this week. We visit Ashfield Farm in Mid-Argyll, where hydro schemes are being used to generate electricity. And following the dry summer seen in parts of the country, Mark Bowsher Gibbs gives us an update on Harvest 2022. Today we're visiting Ashfield, a beef and sheep farm in Mid-Argyll that is effectively using the natural resources on the holding to generate power using water. Welcome to Ashfield Farm. It's a family owned farm on the west coast of Scotland, 750 acres. We're well diversified. We have uh, a mixture of livestock and uh, renewable energy. We specifically diversified into, into hydro 30 years ago and uh, here we are today. How did we get into hydro? We actually got into farming through hydro. We originally looked for a farm that had hydro potential and Ashfield was the ideal candidate really. It was affordable, it was in the right location, it had the right resources for hydro uh, and so the farm in this sense is a byproduct of the hydro. We came here 30, 38 years ago as a family and chose the place specifically because, well, it's a lovely farm but it did have renewable potential. We all felt that it was a, a natural resource which was not being utilised at the time so we were very fortunate in being able to buy it. So how does a hydro scheme work? Basically, a hydro scheme uses the potential energy of water so what we're looking for is a bulk of water, a unit of water and a unit of height. So we take a, a river or a lock, we identify how much volume we've got, we then multiply that or by the, the height. So in other words, if you have a, a large drop, you have a lot of power. If you double the height, you have twice the power. So it's a, it's a question of looking at the topography uh, and, and then analyzing that resource um, and also looking for things which are buildable um, sites, which uh, you're able to tap that resource um, efficiently and also an area that you can then export that, uh, that product to because electricity is fine, but you need to get it somewhere. So, so it's a combination of uh, the water resource, the height you can drop that water resource for, the geographical location or, or proximity to, to the grid. It's using the potential energy of water. It's very heavy stuff. Uh, and you, you, you put that, that pressure through a turbine and, and use that pressure to that turbine to drive a generator. Ideally, we're looking for um, a steady water flow. Ideally, a, a reservoir or a lock or something that we can control that water from. Um, we're looking for the most height we can get and we're looking for, again, the proximity to a grid. One of the good things about having a reservoir is that you can then release that energy or generate that power um, when the electricity is needed. Typically today, you get a lot of photovoltaics and wind. They sort of dominate that, the, the renewables markets, neither of which are easy to predict long-term uh, and they're also not controllable. You have to you generate wind on a windy day and you generate photovoltaics on a sunny day. So for instance, today we would have quite a bit of photovoltaics, but in the middle of winter when you actually need it, there's, the sun's not gonna shine. I suppose, first of all, you need to analyze and understand your resource. Yes, you've got a river. Is it large enough to, to generate? Is it gonna be commercial? And also, uh, are you going to be exporting that energy or are you going to be using it yourself? If you use the energy yourself, it's, it's the most efficient way because obviously, you're importing at the moment we've got an energy crisis and uh, you can be importing energy from anything up to 80 pence a kilowatt hour at the moment whereas export tariffs are typically 10 pence a kilowatt hour so if you build a hydro and you're exporting your economics are based on 10p which is your export if you use it yourself the economics are based upon the import tariff which is 80 pence so there's little things like that so I think the first thing to do is to get a professional audit or resource audit, uh, someone to look at the, 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 the potential uh, and, and go from there. Drought has affected the majority of the country this year. What effect does that have on Ashfield's hydro scheme? I think that's really linked to climate change. What we're, what we're seeing is big polarizations when it comes to, to rainfall. We're getting feast and a famine really. So what affects it's obviously very disruptive. It's not ideal, which is where reservoirs come into, into play. So here at Asheville, we have three hydro stations. Uh, we've got a small 15 kilowatt machine, which, uh, which uh, powers the farm. We have the one behind you is 500 kilowatts, which has a limited amount of storage. And of course, drought is, you know, it, it just stops it. On the other side of the farm, we have a 500 kilowatt scheme with about a month's storage. So that's the sort of ideal situation where you can hold that water back. And so you can, you can get through most droughts and still generate. How long does a typical new installation take to pay for itself? 
very difficult question. It's a little bit like the proverbial how long's a bit of string. Um, so again, it, 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 as I intimated before, it depends upon the size and what you're doing with that power. If you're using it yourself, um, and the price of power is very expensive at the moment, your typical, you know, you can, you can, you can probably achieve a three or four year payback. However, in normal circumstances, it's a very long term asset. Um, you know, it could be 20, up to 20 years. Having said that, hydro stations have lasted a long time. It's not like a wind turbine, which after 25 years you have to replace. Typical hydro stations, such as the one you see behind you, will be here in 100 years. So a 20 year payback doesn't sound fantastic, but it's there for a very long time. You know, we started this 30 years ago, 38 years ago, actually. There wasn't a lot of, uh, well, there was no, no consultants back in those days. So we sort of learnt on the job and we've done a, a, made, made a few mistakes. But with hindsight, you know, it's the, making those mistakes which you actually learn from. So, you know, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. What advice does Roy have for his younger self? If, if at all, I would have probably been more brave. Be prepared to take a risk. Uh, think outside the box and probably been a bit more flexible when it comes to do we make that investment decision or not. Generally speaking, follow your gut feeling and actually do, do things. The big mistake is not to act quick enough. Hello and uh, welcome to this brief roundup of Harvest 2022. We're standing here in the Pentland Hills just south of Edinburgh. Got an opportunity now just to reflect on the season and see how the harvest went. And uh, for many places, September has brought you know, well over 50 mils of rain. So as we move into the cultivation period, there's plenty of rape that's gone in the ground and uh, is uh, chitting away nicely. But um, in terms of the harvest, well, apart from a few pockets of spring barley and a few pockets of spring beans, obviously the harvest is off. And um, by all accounts, it seems to have been one of the earliest harvests we've had for about 25 years. Certainly the rape was all off by the 15th of August. Um, the yields across the area uh, won't break any records. Um, and it's surprising that perhaps they're not as high as we thought they might be. Uh, wheat seems to have averaged between 8.2 and 8.6 tonnes a hectare. Uh, winter barley between 7.2 and 7.4 tonnes a hectare and both oats and uh, spring barley uh, getting up towards the 5.9 tonnes a hectare. Rapeseed is only reported to have been roughly in the region of 3.2 to 3.6 tonnes a hectare which is surprising because the feedback I've had is that there are some pretty heavy yields out there. So my guess is that whilst that's the average there is quite a range of yields across the crops. Perhaps one would imagine in such a dry summer, it's a heavy land that's produced the yields. And certainly some of the spring barley is on the lighter land that got uh, drought uh, prone. Um, there has been issues there on, on yield delivery on spring barley with talk of perhaps some growers on lighter land moving towards autumn sown crops. If this sort of climatic change is to continue with the dry springs that we're getting. It's worth noting too that actually a lot of the thousand grain weights uh, are going to be high. The specific weights on wheat and barley uh, is high for the season. So when you're saving that seed for drilling, just bear in mind that you're drilling big seed and if you're aiming for so many plants per square metre, you probably have to put the seed rate up from what you'd normally expect to get those uh, number of seeds per metre squared in the ground. Another feature of the harvest was that proteins were fairly low in wheat specifically and I think that was due to the, again, the dry uh, summer where nitrogen efficiency uptake was pretty poor. Um, Hagbergs uh, have been fine, but as most of the wheat's growing for distilling here in Scotland, the demand for the 13% protein in the wheats isn't, isn't a requirement anyway. For the UK as a whole, it seems that the wheat uh, harvest is going to produce just shy of 16 million tonnes, uh, which is a big crop. Um, and um, we should have an exportable surplus of about 2 million tonnes uh, to trade out of the country over the forthcoming season. Here in Scotland, the demand for distilling wheat has grown significantly, probably up 20% on uh, last year. And that's going to support the uh, local prices for uh, the distilling uh, wheat uh, varieties that are grown here. In the same way too, the uh, processing capacity in Scotland for uh, malting barley um, has risen again. And um, that'll certainly help to underpin prices uh, more locally too. 
Wheat currently in the borders is trading about £265 a tonne for September and roughly a £10 a tonne premium to uh, wheat coming out of England. What's the six month uh, outlook for wheat? Uh, it's still fairly bullish uh, and it really reflects the concerns of the global uh, supply issues. Uh, but it's lessened somewhat by the very good harvests that are reported to be coming out of uh, North America and Australia. Much of the uh, pricing mechanism will also depend uh, this winter on the rate of exports out of the Black Sea region and just how quickly uh, they gain in volume. Horseseed rape uh, is currently trading about just over £500 a tonne. The uh, future trading uh, positions for rape post Christmas are fairly uncertain. Um, Europe's deemed to have increased its production of oilseed rape this year by over 13% and the US and Canada have also uh, had good harvests so uh, it is potentially a crop that uh, you might want to take a position on earlier rather than later on this season. A final word perhaps on grain storage and with such a rapid harvest uh, and grain going into store so quickly and with the ambient, te ambient temperatures being as high as they were during the harvest, there's going to be a lot of grain stores there with grain that's going to need cooling fairly promptly. And um, as the uh, weather windows sort of open for farmers to get on and get crops in, uh, you've got to install a pretty rigorous approach to cooling your grain such that uh, it's cooled quickly and efficiently. And in terms of getting the temperature down, uh, you really want to try and get the temperature down to um, below 10 degrees C, certainly by Christmas, um, and 15 degrees C um, by mid-October. Uh, so do bear that in mind uh, if you are storing grain for sale post-Christmas. So to sum up, it's been an early harvest uh, of good quality and probably more reasonable yields than we would have expected. But at the same time, there's a lot of uncertainty looking forward as to the input costs for the following crop. And with the uh, nitrogen uh, production facilities closing, uh, reducing substantially in England, a lot of that uh, nitrogen has got to come in from abroad. And with the weak sterling, that's only going to push up the prices.